Uh, hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. My name is Eddie Pauline and I'm a member of CMC's Board of Trustees and serve as a Director of Business Development for Ohio State's Office of Corporate Engagement. Today's forum, Out in Office, is the Lynn Greer Legacy Forum, sponsored by Ulmer in partnership with PFLAG Columbus, Stonewall Columbus, and the Columbus Museum of Art, and Out and Loud. I'm sorry, Columbus Museum of Art, it's Out and Loud. Each are represented here today by many friends and associates. Won't you please thank them? As of today, there are at least 698 LGBTQ plus elected officials in the United States, a 25% increase over 2018. However, that number is less than two tenths of 1% of all elected officials. While we have an openly gay candidate and contender in Mayor Pete running for President of the United States, the Supreme Court is deciding whether open discrimination against working LGBTQ citizens is the law of the land or not. This is a lot to talk about. So today, please welcome President and, C T and CEO of the LGBTQ Victory Institute and former Mayor of Houston, Anise Parker, We wondered if the audience would clap after each name, and sure enough. <laughs> President, of, <laughs> President of Columbus City Council, Shannon Harden. <laughs> Auditor of the City of Columbus, Megan Kilgore, and former classmate. <laughs> and our host, partner at Squire Patton and Boggs, Mary Jo Hudson. Mary Jo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're, we're not going to get into a lot of bio detail. There's uh, information about all of us uh, on your uh, place cards. Uh, before we get started with the panel, I do think we should do a special recognition uh, of um, the person who brought us all together today, and that's Lynn Greer. Um, <laughs> I, I remember being uh, just out of law school in uh, the late 80s, early 90s, and, um, and uh, an assistant dean who I'd worked for um, and who was a cl very closeted lesbian uh, said, you should think about running for office someday. And I remember telling her, no one would vote for anybody like me. And then I met Len Greer, and I knew that people could vote for us, and she believed so passionately in being and getting folks in office from the LGBT community, uh, and she helped me be a believer too. So thank you, Lynn. So we have, this is an amazing panel, so I'm looking forward to, to uh, some questions today, and, and we'll look forward to your questions as well. So, uh, Mayor Parker, welcome to Columbus. Um, Thank you. And we're all happy to have you here. So first I'd like to ask you, uh, ask the, for the panel, um, what does it mean today to be an elected official? Not just because you're LGBT, but what does it mean to be an elected official today? Uh, and Mayor Parker just recently left office, so um, if you'd like to start us out. Well, and not only have I been, in, I was in office in Houston for 18 years, but I, I now work with uh, elected officials across the country are soon to be elected officials or hopeful, elected, elected hopefuls across the, the country. And, you know, the fundamental job is, is the same, and that is to do the best job you can possibly do every day for your constituents. But I think in the current political climate, we also have responsibilities to show that, that government works, that government can be trusted, and that there, that a, we can work together to have a stronger, better democracy. All of my races have been at the local level, and that is the one level of government that must work, because if the, you know, if the trash doesn't get picked up and the toilets don't flush, you have a really bad day. <laughs> and uh, we see this every day. For the most part, American cities work very, very well, and that we'd love to be able to send some of that uh, toward our nation's capital, where you're not get away from the tribalism and focus on what's the job? What can we do every day to make it better? 
Oh, I'm going to ask a kind of a question because something, you know, in, in the office of the auditor, we're about transparency, financial reporting, you know, communicating the city's um, everything with respect to its fiscal foundation to the citizens. But in, in my generation, the, frankly, the internet, and so as, as, as Shannon's, has always been a part of it. I'm really curious, the access that constituents have to us now has really probably had to change quite a bit during your, your tenure. Will you speak to that? Uh, so I was first elected to office uh, 22 years ago, and it, uh, it, it's changed fundamentally. There is nothing, there, first of all, there's no such thing as a private moment in public for any one of us, but most especially for a public official. Whatever you do, wherever you are, there is someone with a recording device, there's one right out there, <laughs> someone with a recording device always present. Uh, so the idea that you can have a a, a public persona and a private persona, that's one of the things that has completely yeah. fallen by the way. And I think a lot of uh, senior politicians, uh, politicians of another era used to think you could, you could do that. And the other is that you, you get lots and lots of engagement from the wrong people. Happy people do not show up at a government body to tell you they are happy. Right. <laughs> Most. Okay, you know, it's, it's, yeah. the, it's the angry people. The happy people are home being happy. It's the unhappy people who show up. That's yeah. but number one of the person who's not currently elected, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the social media, it's, it's unhappy people all the time trying to push their message out to you. And the first thing you need to learn is when you can, what you can turn off and what you mm -hmm. can't. And it's hard to filter. But, you know, I think that that's why it's so important and, and I really frame my public service around uh, municipal uh, governance and um, I think I serve best when I go to Kroger's and am able to uh, respond to the concerns. Um, and that's where I actually do find some happy people um, yeah. at, at Kroger's. <laughs> My husband, Ben, just knows to walk away when, I, when somebody comes up to me. But, you know, there's a level of connection that I get on the local level that I would not ever want to give up as long as I'm in, in public office that um, I really don't have to take a poll to know what is working and what is not. I call it the Kroger caucus will tell me. Um, and, uh, and for me, it holds me accountable. It encourages me because usually it's just, you're doing a good job. Uh, but um, and, and so for, for us and picking up with uh, Mayor Parker said, um, you know, the responsibility for local elected officials to um, really get outside of what we are, are, are what the, um, the, the what the, the code says or what the uh, charter says for us to do is so much greater today in this political environment. Uh, we are looking, folks are looking to real leadership. They're looking for government to work. They're looking for moral leadership um, in ways that I think are different um, in the last three years. And so, I mean, we're having conversations now that we have never had before around immigration and around rights that um, truthfully it is just us leaning in just on behalf of our uh, of our constituents. It used to be that uh, we couldn't necessarily count on the state and the federal government to help us, but we weren't worried about them necessarily hurting us. Um, now we have to play a defensive role um, for the hearts, minds, and the, the laws of, of, our, of our constituents. And we're with our constituents all the time, yeah. too. Yeah. That oh, is totally. the difference. Yeah. I got asked the other day, you know, why does an auditor care about equality? Why would an auditor feel like she should be, you know, at the table trying to communicate the importance of equality to the state legislature? Of course, as a, as a person, I inherently care. But the city's well-being in terms of its prosperity, the only way that the city of Columbus is going to move forward and the state of Ohio and our country is if every walk of life has an even playing field. And when you look at, uh, when you look at the city of Columbus, as, as Shannon um, just described, immigration, the last time our population here in the county was 10% immigrant born was all the way back in 1890. Think about that, 1890, we're 10% immigrant born now. Persons of color, 96% of our population growth since 2000 has been solely from persons of color. And so when you look at what the activism that, you know, frankly, Shannon and I are doing at the legislature, it's because that we have to move our economy forward. It is dependent. If we want our citizens to prosper, they're going to have to be able to do business, and we don't want anyone to be turned away from doing business in our state. Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, uh, Megan, I think you bring up uh, a great point, and I recently even came up at the debate, debate the, uh, the Ellen George W. Bush discussion at the recent football game or something. I mean, I, the, at time, as in, in, in serving in public office, mm -hmm. you're there for everybody. Uh, what's it like or what's that service? How does it change your service that you are an openly gay public official? Mm -hmm. You know, it was funny, I was, I was having uh, this conversation earlier with someone on my, my staff, and I think anyone who is frankly um, serving in office who um, may be at some point underrepresented, we kind of come into this role with a different appreciation for sign finding those inequalities and trying to best support them. Um, but I would, I was, you know, frankly, I think, you know, what you and I were both alluding to, it just makes us more appropriate representatives to the overall body of our very diverse city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the idea that someone shouldn't, that, that uh, Ellen shouldn't sit next to a former president is just absurd. And uh, again, we have gotten to a, a state of tribalism at the, at the federal level, but at the local level, it is about constituent services. What is, what is the need of the, the larger community? Uh, I'm in a, a Houston's a progressive city in a, in a big toxic red state, as are most of the cities in Texas, very fairly progressive. But uh, the, the elder Bushes were my constituents. Barbara Bush endorsed me when I ran for mayor of Houston. I'm a Democrat. There's no, was no surprise there. And I was an out lesbian. She endorsed me because she thought I was the best possible mayor for Houston. That's what politics yeah. should be about. And how is... George W. Gonna, gonna learn if he can't sit next to Ellen and have an Ellen talk, a, talk about the issues that are important to her mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree, agree more. Um, and and I'm, I'm someone who, um, I'm married to a, a Republican, a gay white Republican, but he's, he's still a, a Republican. Um, <laughs> you need to work harder. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but, I mean, if we cannot get outside of our bubbles and if we cannot learn to, I mean, what we're doing is we're adopting this cynicism and this tribalism that the mayor talked about and we're bringing it into our um, churches and we're bringing it into our homes we're bringing it into our communities, and we cannot move forward as a country. We cannot move forward as a growing city if we cannot talk to people who have different views than, than we are. Uh, it is so, so important uh, that we have those relationships, that we build those relations, that we lean into those conversations. It's the only thing that has ever united us uh, was our ability to be next to someone who has, has uh, different opinions. Um, and that's the only way that we are able to, to bring people into the fold and, and get greater understanding uh, is being able to, to engage. And so, um, you know, it, it, there's that conversation. I, I, I was I'm definitely following that conversation, but there were also conversations around race that uh, mm -hmm. is becoming a very othering conversation. Um, it, the one that, that got that popped up last week was um, the the judge who came off the bench to to hug the police officer. If we can't show compassion um, in some of our toughest moments, then what are we here for? Like what, what really are, are we here for? There's so much that we have to, that we have to do and there's so much healing that needs to happen. Um, and, and if compassion has, becomes a bad word, then, you know, then, then we really are in, in a bad place. Oh, sure. So, speak to your constituents. Please. Yeah, very eloquent. Yeah. I'll tell a little story. Uh, whenever I was running for office, um, you know, sometimes you're running for office and you're seeking endorsements and historic, um, historically, you know, very, on this table, you know, democratic groups. We could, not that we anticipate their endorsements, but I think there is some, uh, I guess, perception that we have a stronger likelihood of obtaining. And I ran into uh, an interesting conversation with the Baptist Ministerial Alliance. You might be able to speak to this a little bit too. Um, but long story short, they chose not to endorse me. And that was hard. And I remember sitting down and I thought, oh, this was a few weeks before election day. And I got the call that they had endorsed my opponent, my opponent who, hmm. you know, supported Trump, who actually said Trump was the best president the United States had ever had, and made some very unfortunate remarks on his social media. 
And, you know, my partner, Steph, who I think several of you know, she kind of went to this kind of scrappy-do, let me at them, you know, kind of mentality. <laughs> and I said, you know what, no, you know, because to be honest, I didn't, I didn't spend enough time with one of the most important groups of the builders of our city. And so that week, I reached out to the founder. And for those of you who may not know the Baptist Ministerial Alliance, they carry not only a great deal of weight, but a great number of votes and a great, great level of collaboration to get folks to the polls. And so I sat down with each, I sat down with 17 members of their, I'll say their executive leadership organization. And every single lunch, every single coffee, every single breakfast, I learned something about them while they learned something about me. And I didn't take that for granted. Through those meetings, I learned about their, you know, frankly being turned away at the pools in Columbus. I mean, these, are general, these gentlemen were all 70s, 80s, and some in their 90s. And I learned more about the fabric of our city in a way that I never had. At that Friday before election day, um, one of the best calls I ever received was them calling me to say, we've decided to rescind our endorsement and give you our endorsement. And that was, that was awesome. But it speaks only a little bit to, to me and more to our, our collective opportunity to converse and learn more about one another. And I still, and I know Shannon has tried to cultivate that ongoing relationship. Yeah, I mean, I'm a person of strong, strong faith, and um, I had a similar experience when uh, my first time running, um, when I went to the uh, Baptist uh, Minister Alliance uh, for an endorsement, I was actually the only um, black and Baptist on the ballot, uh, and, and I didn't get their endorsement. Um, and um, it, it, it was eye-opening to me, um, and um, but I didn't let that, that get in the way. I, um, my faith was so much stronger, uh, and the role that, that faith plays in my life, and, but also in a lot of African Americans' lives, I was not going to let a political process um, and a political endorsement um, uh, at all get in the way. So I, and after I got onto council, I, I had ar already, I had been a member of a historically black church, a um, church that I think in the community folks um, uh, saw as, as cons a conservative church. And I got a lot of pressure to, to leave my church uh, because of, um, of, of where they were maybe in the past. And I um, really pushed back against that because um, for, for whatever reason, I mean, the, the role that the black church plays in, in our lives in the black community um, I was not going to be pushed out of the church, and I thought the only way that I could change it was to stick there and to stay there. I had a pastor who maybe several years ago was on the more conservative side. Um, that My pastor, who we lost this year, um, took me in, um, defended me, um, fought for me. When I went up for council president, um, it was his work that really sealed the deal and got it done. And I think that if I would have allowed those early days after the appointment and the conversations that were around, um, I would have missed an amazing opportunity to, one, feel loved in an environment that um, needed to see an openly gay person. Um, and I, it was in, after Pastor Pass, one of our church members uh, saw me in, in the grocery store in Kroger's. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, I, I do go to yeah. Kroger's very often. She has got a little desk in the side. Yeah. <laughs> Kroger's on Main Street. You can catch me every. Um, but she leaned in and she said, you know what? You change Pastor. And that took, um, that, that was really powerful. This was right after he passed. And what I told her back, no, he changed me um, because we both learned, I think, from each other. And um, I'm just so appreciative of uh, my church, uh, the Mount Olive Baptist Church, um, of my pastor uh, and the, my church family. And I think that we're changing hearts and minds um, by being there. Mm -hmm. I want to say I had some very similar experiences. Actually, we have a... Baptist Pastors Council, very similar to your, your story. But one of the things that I did while I was uh, in office is that uh, one, one Sunday each month, I would go to a different church. I didn't do the, uh, the church campaigning, which does happen 
regularly in the South, which is you hit five churches on a Sunday and you're running in and out. I felt that was disrespectful to the, to the churches and the congregations. Yeah. But I would go to a different church and stay for the entire yeah. service. I'd mingle with folks at the beginning. I would stay for the service. We'd mingle with folks at the end. I know early on I was walking out until people got used to me doing it. And like, well, I have seen a miracle today. You know, there's a politician who came and stayed the whole service. Um, but it, it took me into, it took me in, in primarily in, in uh, black churches, because the white churches would get uncomfortable when I would say, hey, or they, they, my staff would call and say, hey, the controller wants to come or the mayor wants to come and just, we, we, don't, we don't want politicking. She just wants to come to the service. No, we don't really want. But the black churches yeah. were very welcoming. I was, at one service, I was specifically invited as a mega church. We have, actually we have some of the largest churches in America, including the largest church in America in Houston, uh, Lakewood. And uh, one of the, a pastor had invited me for a special little ceremony. I took both my kids with me and their prayer leader stood up and went on an anti-gay rant. And I'm on the front pew as a guest of the pastor and I just quietly got up and took my girls by the hand and we walked out of the church. Uh, and he, pastor called me the next day to apologize. Uh, and we just, we kept on doing it but because they needed, they needed to see me because they were my constituents, yeah. but I needed to be there and to hear about their lives and to, so that government wasn't out there. Government was on the church pew next to them. Government is in the Kroger, uh, you know, waiting at the, the checkout line. And I, and I mentioned uh, Lakewood Church and Joel Osteen. Uh, when I was inaugurated as mayor, I asked him uh, to uh, give the inaugural prayer, which he did, and I got criticized and he got criticized. And uh, we, we both, you know, from the left and the right, and we both said the same thing, and that it was about launching me and my term as mayor with the best possible support, and it was about the city, not about the two of us standing there, and then they needed to get over it, essentially. Yeah. So. It was funny, when I um, first ran that, that first time, as somebody who works uh, with us, who does black faith outreach, uh, explaining to me that don't get too worked up that you didn't get the endorsement. They're really for you. They just couldn't endorse you. And you're going to be fine as long as you don't walk down, this is a quote, as long as you don't walk down High Street waving away a, a gay uh, rainbow flag. Oops. And <laughs> I thought that was so great that I, I got around that by every pride year I wear a gay rainbow flag on my shirt and I walk down High Street. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, I guess I, I would like to just acknowledge as we close this part of the conversation, um, and to, when I ran in for city council in 2005, there were a large number of folks in the African American community who helped me navigate the pastors. Our goal was to not have them preach out against me. I did screen with them. They, ironically, they didn't screen me for school board a couple of years ago, but I, uh, Janet Jackson is here, and Janet was one of many folks who behind the scenes did a lot of great work on behalf of all of our communities. So we have a lot of folks that have plowed the road for us and worked for us for a long time uh, for um, LGBT candidates that have been here in Columbus. Can, can I make one more point, though? Please. I, think, I do think it's important, since we are in a, in a room of a family of folks who are, are um, out uh, and have the ability to influence conversations, We it is important important for us to focus on the need for the black community and the black church to, to move and to become more progressive. And I think that that is happening and will continue to happen. Um, but we also have to look inward too as a gay community and, and know that every black person doesn't feel as welcomed in the gay community either. And so as we are looking outward and looking at what they can the, the black and black church can do, we must also look inward too as a, a gay community uh, to make sure that because the worst thing could to be as a, a black gay person and not feel all the way welcomed in the church and not all the way welcomed in the gay community also. So I just yeah. want to make sure we um, ha made that point. That's right. Great. So maybe from these experiences, what can uh, folks here today uh, learn from your experiences so far? I'll share, um, you know, when you think about the trajectory, you know, how are we being fared uh, LGBTQ locally, statewide, nationally? Locally, Columbus is solid. You know, we were a sanctuary city well before those words were ever put together. 
We gave women the right to vote in our city years before national suffrage, and we had leaders in our community supporting equality well before any of us on this stage were ever, ever in office. Statewide, the antiquity of some of the policies are causing me a great deal of, of distress. And you know, every time I get nationally, I mean, that's a whole nother, whole nother CMC luncheon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I think though about, you know, the hardest part as, as being auditor has been being in rooms with the best companies in our world looking to move to Columbus, Ohio. Perfect example, Amazon, eight page RFP. First of all, in government, eight pages never happens. Mm -hmm. But eight page RFP, one of their scoring criteria specifically stated equal protections for every walk of life, every single one of their employees. Columbus A, everyone else didn't pass the test. State failed, federal government failed right now, right? Their biggest concern was if any of their employees drive out of town, if they live in Columbus, or excuse me, they work in Columbus, they, they drive to one of the, you know, half an hour away, let's be honest, you can still be fired for being gay. Their, their partners, their spouses, their children. Um, let's look at, you know, in the last 30 days, the headlines that have come out of the statewide leaders. And I brought a couple of them. Yoast, Columbus Dispatch 823, AG Yoast. No civil rights protections for LGBT workers. Columbus Dispatch 10-1, Ohio House GOP refuses to extend discrimination protections to LGBTQ employees. When you have headlines like that, and I wrote an op-ed, and uh, I, I did so um, like 11 o'clock the night before, and I failed to tell my staff who the next morning said, please, before you call out the AG of Ohio, please give us a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> My bad, they're all in the back too. That's why they're getting lunch today. But I, I equated those headlines, which are absolutely not necessary. They're not necessary. To a small business putting on their door, 15% of you, 25% of you are not welcome to do business in my small business. There is no difference in the way that the state is treating business. We're getting lapped. Michigan is growing better and stronger because of us. And so my, my request of you, this is what, you know, two months ago I got to go with some of the, uh, Anissa and, and Lynn Greer, got to go to Google and talk about this. But let's be clear, when Wall Street's backing this, when Amazon's backing this, the tide will turn, but everyone in this room has a touch point to that collective economic power. Your law firms, your small businesses, that's what I would ask you to do. Leverage that power and take that to the State House right now. So, speaking about what, what we can learn from, from our experiences, I guess I would go a little bit more pers just on the personal side. I remember when I w went up for, um, uh, where, well, before I, I went into elected office, I was the liaison to the U.S. Conference of Mayors for former Mayor Coleman. Mm -hmm. And it was on a flight back home uh, from one of the conferences that he started to talk to me about the need to serve um, and to serve an elected office. And um, he, he, he said, uh, Shannon, it's time for you to, to step out and, and run for something. And I said, well, Mayor, I'm too liberal for this city. I'm, um, I'm only 26. And he said, well, Shannon, I know how old you are. And I said, well, well Mayor, I'm not just young, but, uh, but I'm also a young black man, and he's like, Shannon, I can see that. <laughs> and then I said, well, Mayor, no, I'm not just young and black, I'm young, black, and gay. And he said, well, Shannon, that's only an issue if you see it as an issue. It's that very reason why you must step out, and you must step out now, because as, as a city grows, and especially a progressive city, they must see themselves in their, rep in their representation. And I think that that is true for each and every one of us. Whatever it is and whoever we are that we represent, it is incumbent on us to be that and be the best of it, because you can't um, really serve your best at your work if you're not bringing your best to work. Um, you don't know who is looking up to you or watching you and and um, just your single act of being you, what that does for folks around you. And so um, what I hope folks can learn is that it works. It is okay. Um, if you step out there and if you really lean into 100% of uh, your authenticity, um, that the universe gets behind you and uh, pushes you uh, and people appreciate it. Okay. Yeah.
as you can tell from the, the bios in the, on your program, I now lead uh, two organizations, the LGBT Victory Fund and the LGBT Victory Institute, and we're an organization focused solely on helping LGBTQ candidates achieve political office. We are better and stronger as communities, as a nation, when all of us are represented in public life. And we have a, we have a singular, singular focus on that, but we also recognize that in order to secure our full rights as an LGBT community, but also as Americans, we have to work together in coalition. We, we work with allies, we work with sister organizations supporting uh, various minority communities. We have to be willing to find issues where we can all come together to advance progress, get to know each other, and then turn to each other and say, okay, now I need your help. Mm -hmm. You don't go to somebody and say, I need your help. You go first to find something to work together and get to know each other, and then you turn to each other. And we want to be a, a good partner, and uh, we as LGBT public officials want to be good partners, but we also represent every community. The, the sort of the definition of intersectionality, as you said, young, gay, and, and black. And as an organization, we have focused on uh, trying to make an easier path for those members of our community who want to go into public office who, who come from underrepresented communities. And uh, we have to think about that in the, the long term as well. But I want to say every one of us has to be involved in community. Not necessarily in politics, and not everybody should run for office. <laughs> but we have to be involved in community. And it can't be I'm doing it because it's my job or I'm doing it because it benefits me in some way. We have a civic responsibility, and we ought to be teaching our kids that, and we ought to be preaching that anywhere and everywhere. Every one of us has to be engaged in what happens in the common area, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our country. We can't just say, and I think more and more people are recognizing that now, we can't just say, that's someone else's problem. We are all in this together. We rise or we fall together. Yeah, that's great. So, so in just a few minutes, uh, we will move to audience questions. Um, and the microphone will be over here, uh, about five minutes. So, uh, so we'll have time for one more official question and then hear from you. So start to think about your questions. Um, so for the panel, uh, how do each of you will step up? We've been talking about the greater community and how we fit in. How do you view things for the LGBTQ community? Uh, at this time, we've had more, we have multi-generation, um, uh, more emphasis on uh, seeing everyone as a whole, but where do you see things going uh, from this point for us? All right, I'll take that one. Yeah. So I'm the, the senior member of this panel. <laughs> Uh, and I have a Wikipedia page, there are no secrets, I'm 63 years old. And I attended my first LGBT organizing event in 1975. I was an activist before I went into to politics, and I've seen a lot of the arc of our movement. We are so far ahead of where I ever dreamed we would be. But what I have learned painfully over the last couple of years is that uh, progress isn't guaranteed. Once you get there, it doesn't mean you can't go backwards. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing what happens when we, we take our foot off the accelerator and we, st we think, oh, well, I can, I can lay my burden down. No, you have to keep uh, pushing forward for progress. I, I hear a lot that the, Martin, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And people use that as if it's magical thinking. Mm -hmm. We'll eventually get there. We just pray over it, we get there. No, you have to put your hand on that arc okay. and pull it into place and make sure it stays in place for the next generation and the next generation. It's hand on top of hand on top of hand. That's what we have to remember. Thank you. 
I mean, I think it's it's so interesting for me as an openly gay person to um, have experienced the history up close as, as I, I did and lived through it. I mean, um, my friend, um, Dr. June Gutterman, um, she once told me that the Jewish community, they, that they don't have memories, they have history, or they don't have history, they have memories, because history happened to someone else. Memories happen to us, and we're connected to them. Now, watching um, uh, the Burgerville versus Hodges case in my lifetime, not just in my lifetime, if that case would not have happened uh, four years ago, I would not have been able to get married uh, a month ago. Um, and that will that will be a, a living piece of my history, but also a memory. But it's also the memory of all those um, activists and, and folks who did the hard fight leading up to that, that I really will remember. Um, it'll be the, the folks who did the hard thing about coming out to their families um, and, and by doing so changed hearts and minds and neighborhoods and, and made it so. And so now that I'm seeing that history is not just something that is, is just on, on, the, uh, on the bookshelf, I see that it's not over that even though we have made some strides that I keep thinking about, you know, trans people and trans people of color and always being cognizant that um, that my little piece of the fight may have uh, been, been uh, achieved, but the fight is, is not over, that, that folks are still being kicked out of their homes, that there is vulnerability in terms of employment, um, and that my, their vulnerability is still my vulnerability as well. Um, and thus, we still have to be um, uh, in the race and in the fight uh, to, really, uh, to really achieve it. I feel like this week was a really interesting week. Um, all of us were able to spend uh, very significant portions of time with the first really viable candidate, an out man running for president of the United States. And yeah. <laughs> who's raised millions of dollars and is, and is doing remarkably, remarkably well. The contrast is I kind of go back into the state of Ohio and I go back and I reread those headlines and I reread some of the frankly hate mail that we still get as being public servants who also hope it, also also happen to be openly gay, and it's a good reminder that you know Columbus, you know the somewhat utopic environment that we're in, where frankly we are this great gracious supportive group where we will hold up any one of our peers in our city, is not the reality, and that's why you know never. More than ever before, organizations like the Victory Fund, like Kaleidoscope Youth Center, like Stonewall, uh, and the people who built those organizations are all in this room right now. That must be recognized. Mm -hmm. That is why it is so important that we, we continue to double down, because we do have someone running for president, but we are definitely not there. And the same could be said for race, reproductive rights, or a variety of other, you know, frankly, the sociological timelines of all of those um, movements are, are really interesting to consider as well. Fantastic. Well, it's, uh, thank you. And it's uh, now CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Uh, please state your name and your question. And please, uh, if you can, avoid editorial comments. Uh, and remember, questions end with a question mark. So let's get started, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon. My name is Raphael Davis Williams. I am the Director of Equity and Inclusion for the ACLU of Ohio. Um, and I will have one editorial comment. I'm a native Houstonian, born and raised, um, and I'm extremely proud of uh, Mayor Parker. Um, I wanted to follow up on uh, Councilperson um, Harden's comment earlier about um, equity and inclusion from a racial standpoint within the LGBTQ uh, community. You mentioned the need for that, and, and I think we all acknowledge the need for that, uh, but particularly from uh, your perspective and also Mayor, Mayor Parker's uh, perspective, how do we do that on a day-to-day -day basis? What do we need to do to improve uh, the race relations within the gay community so that those who are marginalized uh, within the community are not double marginalized when they step outside of the community? Well, I, I think that what we do um, with diversity and with inclusion, regardless of, of what the, um, who, who we are, it is get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And so it's about um, being intentional about uh, inviting the other in, 
um, and um, having those conversations. It's so much easier um, just to, to call our friends when we're having conversations or just, uh, it's so easy um, to create those spaces where it's, it's just us, but I think that the, the harder act is to, to look around the room, look around the table, see who is not not present uh, and do the harder thing. Um, and, and it's not easy. I, I don't think that um, folks are intentionally, um, they're not intentionally uh, exclu uh, excluding folks from conversations. Um, but we have, we must do, if we really um, are, are striving for true equality and true equity in all of these conversations, especially, especially as we think about the vulnerabilities of our brothers and sisters um, in the black, gay, and trans communities, uh, it is incumbent on us to, to work harder um, at pulling folks in. And, and I can say that uh, folks are doing that work here in Columbus, um, be it um, Stonewall and others um, are really looking through a racial uh, equity lens now. Uh, and, 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 um, and, and so you, you just gotta be intentional. You have to be intentional about that work. It doesn't just happen. Yeah. What, what he said, <laughs> but, but also you, you have to practice conscious inclusion. Every organization has to practice conscious inclusion and looking around the room, we do it We do it at our board meetings, we do it when we think about who's gonna be on stage at every one of our events, that, uh, that it's, it's so easy to default to, uh, as you said, what, when you know, I can call this person, get them there, I don't have to worry about it. No, it's conscious inclusion and it's also acting affirmatively. Somehow, you know, the, the term affirmative action has become a pejorative, but acting affirmatively is what we need to do. And so at Victory, for example, we have our Victory Empowerment Fellowship, which is every year, we, we, we train candidates and uh, work very hard to help people pr prepare to run for office, but we have a special program for uh, candidates of color and trans candidates. Instead of a four-day program, we do a year leadership training plus a four-day program to help give them a leg up. All of us as activists in organizations who, who care about full inclusion, not just from the LGBT community, but as human beings, we have to practice both of those things, the, the conscious inclusion and then the affirmative action on that inclusion. Great question. Uh, my name is Rob Lees. Um, last week, we celebrated National Coming Out Day, a day to celebrate the coming out stories of our community in recognition of those uh, living, still living in the closet. An important part of any coming out story and being able to thrive out of the closet is allyship. I was wondering if you could share for the allies in the room any advice on what it means to be a good ally. You know, we just had this, we, we just answered that question about, about uh, inclusion and if, if you're an ally, it's that, it's that conscious inclusion as well. Being aware, I know that the LGBTQ community is broad, and I, while I often am in a position where I'm expected to speak for the community, I know that I cannot completely represent the community. And so folks have to be in the room to talk about their own life, life and lived experiences. And so for an ally, making sure that that uh, the voices of the LGBT community are there and when, when it, in the room where it happens. But also that you stay aware of what issues are. I have a responsibility to, to stay aware and conscious of what's happening in the Black Lives Matter movement or the, the immigration communities uh, that are working around immigration. We, that's part of our total, civic engagement responsibility. We have to understand and then look for opportunities to build connections. The word responsibility, I think, is the most important word for us all to consider. And within our respective roles, what does that word mean and how do we take our role and support the initiatives that we care deeply about? And I'll give you a, a perfect example in this room. Um, she was never an elected official, but Mary Lazarus has helped build this city to a land of, of um, as much equity as she possibly can. And you know, that is just a simple example, but you know, elected responsibility carries a different weight. We have to look at all across the board what will make our community a better place. Um, but my God, there's some spectacular leaders in this room right now who have really advanced our city for the better. Yeah.
President Hardin, do you want to uh, respond at all? Um, I mean, it, actually, I, I was stumped for a minute, so I'm glad I had a little bit of time. <laughs> um, you know, the best thing I can think of for, for an ally is you don't have to have all the answers. Like, you, you, sometimes folks want to come up to be an ally and think that they have to be gayer than you are uh, to, to make you feel comfortable. That's not what we're asking for. We're, we're, we're I think, to, a good ally is someone who is open to the conversation, and open to learning. Um, and then when they are empowered by what they have learned from their friends, um, then using that to go back into the, their circles that truthfully we can't go into or the conversations that we truthfully are not in um, to push back on. So I just say be great, be open. I'm glad you got unstumped. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> nice Please. Hi, uh, I'm Izzy. I'm a student from The Ohio State University and I'm also the mm -hmm. secretary for Pride OSU, which is the largest LGBT org uh, on campus and possibly in Columbus. We have a listserv of about 2,000 students. Mm -hmm. um, my question to you all is, what can we as students do to engage in conversations and actions with the greater Columbus community, like as an LGBT org specifically? Good. You wanna start, Mayor? Mm -hmm. I, I will say that first of all, I was I was one of the founders of my student association back in 1979. <laughs> so you never know where you're going to end up when you start as a student activist. Uh, first of all, building a support network on campus in your own arena is is critical, and then. Form habits and connections, they're gonna have a better answer what to do here, but form habits and connections that take you as you leave the university and into the broader community because this is not, this is not there's no end to this. Activism is forever. The, the ability, the need to, to continue to push for change is forever and so what you do now will, will uh, you'll, you'll learn from it, but it'll also sort of set the course for you. And so the more people, the more students you can engage, the better. Yeah, I, I would just add that, um, and I usually tell um, college groups, sometimes I feel like they think that that is their, the work that they're doing is um, uh, a little bit less than or, or less uh, impactful than, or, or like soon as you graduate, then your work really will begin, that this is just the training wheels period. I mean, the work that you're doing right now is real. Um, it is it's impactful. Um, you have the power, you have the time, a little bit more time now to be able to, fo to be focused. So I would just say continue to lean in, um, bring it off campus. You have amazing partners uh, in this room um, that would, would love to be able to plug in, um, to would love, I mean, we're all elected officials, um, making sure that we have young gay folks out knocking on doors and, and connecting with campaigns. We're three weeks out from an election. Um, having folks um, come off of campus, use that energy that you're doing right now um, um, in the day-to-day, -day, I, I promise you there are folks in this room right now who um, are going to run to you now uh, because you have a list over 2,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I, I was just making a mental note to tell Beth back there, let's get, the, let's get them in the list, sir. Um, think about your communal strength and look, at, look around at the list, sir, at the, you know, the Columbus Metropolitan Club has. Yeah. This is at Rivals, and that is, a, that is an amazing amount of, of opportunity for you. And think bigger. I, would, um, I think Shannon nailed it when he said think off campus. Your ability right now, um, I'm thinking at Rick Neal's, your, your brilliantly executed campaign, so many, so much uh, of your support was driven by the student community. And from there, I've watched and I have mentored several students who have gotten involved through those campaigns. That's the best thing you can do right now. You know, as an adjunct professor, get involved, emulate, you know, find someone that you want to work for who you really want to emulate. Choose your own boss when you can and align yourself to, to their, their, their opportunities so that you can be a part of that, you can get access to that. And, um, and most importantly, find us afterwards. <laughs> Barbara. Hi, Barb Poppy here, and I promised Mayor Parker I'd come up with a really hard question for you all, so I've been thinking on this one. But um, I, think we're, I think we're aware there's a lot of economic disparities that are happening across our country. Um, and when I look at the numbers, there are great economic disparities when you look at the incomes and the economic factors impacting LGBT people versus those who are not LGBT. And so the question I raise up really is as we look at these, these disparities, whether it's child poverty, ha food insecurity, um, the cause I care you know, most deeply about is homelessness. So we know that 40% of young people who experience homelessness are LGBT. And so I guess the question I have is how, how do we create 
the movement that really rises up everyone, but at the same time really make people aware that there are these true disparities and true impacts on people that are LGBT and need to get solved as part of solving um, our overall and not shy away from it um, because it, it seems, so the question really is, is it's beyond the hearts and minds, there are also systemic and structural issues and how do you see this community rallying together to really um, make some progress on what we see are downward economic declines for so many households, especially people who are LGBT. Well, I think the, the why I love being elected official in Columbus is because when we are brought an issue and really explain, really put out on the table, we have we stack hands better than any community. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, in the country, and we we come together and we we solve big problems. But I think that so I, I don't even think it's it's a heart and mind. I think that we have to bring the data, we have to tell the story, and once we um, galvanize around the issue, the the problem statement, I think that we do have the the, the energy, the know-how, and the the true partnerships to to get it done. And um, and it's really been neat working with Megan this last year because she um, and the Columbus Foundation have been doing a lot of data digging and then telling that story. And I think the more that we can put it right in our, right in our faces about where the, the issue lies, it helps us to zero in um, and, and really find those solutions. It's hard to look at LGBT uh, inequity in terms of especially wealth and economics without, you know, frankly, without um, coupling it with everything else in our community. And, you know, when you think about, you know, the economic prosperity of Columbus, we are only going to be prosperous if it's women, it's persons of color, yeah. it's, um, frankly, immigration, uh, immigrant families, um, it's new American families and LGBTQ persons all rise at the same level, all rise together. Um, I'll tell you something, you know, in this role, the more that I've gotten into this, one of the proudest things, and she's not here right now, but Trudy Bartley at Ohio State did something with the Rise Together report that was published with the Franklin County Commissioner's support. I believe this to be true, um, but it, Mike Wilkos, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think this was the first mass published report ever in our community to on the first page address the structural racism that has existed in our community as being a, frankly, the foundation for inequities. And what that did, if you look, if you look at you know, the history of redlining in the city of Columbus, and I encourage you to do this. I, I'm trying to work on some stuff that I'd love the, um, frankly, business first to think about publishing right now. Um, but when you think about the you know, history of redlining, the same school districts that are the most economically impoverished are still in those areas today. Yeah. The areas, the families with the least amount of wealth the areas that have the most mass incarceration, the, you know, frankly, the, the, the areas the, with the food desert, um, absolutely. Exactly. They're the exact same. And so we have to look at our past to get where we're going to the future. And something that I think is really special about the leadership today is that we have a, a different ability to be very not only agile, but really work together without any ego. And Shannon's right, we talk about this all the time, but we have to look at everything as, a, you know, one one effort to be able to move everything forward. The only thing I would add to that is that we're all in this, we're all in this boat t t together. There are particular pressures on young LGBT people uh, in terms of mental health. We have a higher rate of suicide and we have a higher rate of homelessness and there need to be resources available for them. But the fundamental difference in uh, for LGBT youth is the disconnect from their own families and their own parents. And that's going to take a lot different type of work and understanding to, to bridge. Jim, last question. More than 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I was involved in an effort to get Columbus City employees covered by um, our um, like employees health insurance, like try to get domestic partners covered by employee health insurance. And um, this took advantage of a, a Columbus ordinance that a city councilman named John Kennedy um, you know, got, got passed. And 
I remember during this long struggle, one of the biggest opponents to this, um, this effort was pastors at black churches. And the, um, the threat was that if city council didn't, like city council passed an ordinance to cover this, and the threat from black ministers specifically, from what I understand, was um, if, if city council didn't rescind the ordinance they had passed, um, they would have started an, a referendum against the original ordinance that John Kennedy helped, helped pass. And um, the last thing that happened about all of this was when, um, when the Affordable Care Act passed, you know, federal level, um, Columbus City Council finally got domestic partners of, a, of city employees covered, you know, under the ACA. So my question is, if, if the same thing, if the same sort of thing happened today, but, but it wasn't done like under the, the ACA, um, could the same thing happen? I'm sort of concerned because, you know, like one of the panelists just said, um, statewide there is still no protection for, you know, gay people. Um, there was an article in the paper that said that um, young people aren't as liberal on these issues as, um, you know, my cohorts were. So, so I wonder, what do you think? Would it take the ACA to, to do that if it happened again I'll, today? I'll speak if, uh, if I may, I'll speak to my, my colleagues with the city of Columbus. Um, I think you can all rest assured in this room that at least uh, the two elected officials up here, and I think we can speak for our colleagues, would never allow anything to be um, you know stepped back at the city of Columbus. But factually, you know what you're getting at is the concern as to what we do not have control over, which is state policies as well as some of the federal policies. And frankly, um, maybe that's a softball lob to the mayor to talk about why you know getting more people elected who have these values in line is so important. I think you said it. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I would just say say thank you for your advocacy back then because I, I've said it several times that we st I stand on shoulders. So when I came to council, um, the council before me had already passed those uh, uh, the domestic partner benefits uh, for the city. And so um, thank God for progress. Um, and I think that that's what we've been a part of. Mary Jo yeah. Hudson. Yeah, MJ. So we'll turn the podium back to Eddie. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope everyone found today's forum thought-provoking and a, and a reminder that we're, uh, we're clearly not where we need to be uh, yet and uh, more work is, uh, is needed to be done. And I really liked the idea of conscious inclusion and maybe we can all go back to our offices and places today and figure out how we can practice that uh, before the end of the day. Uh, please help me provide uh, special thanks to Lynn Greer for the establishment of her legacy forum. Help me thank our sponsor, Ulmer, and partners P Flag Columbus, Columbus Museum of Art Out and Loud, and Stonewall Columbus. And of course, let's thank our speakers, Anise Parker, Shannon Harden, Megan Kilgore, and Mary Jo Hudson. And special thanks to all of you, and we look forward to seeing you at the next CMC meeting next week. Thank you.